Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to today's program, How IBM and Mapbox Build Chatbot-Driven Cognitive Progressive Web Apps. Uh, I'm Dave Rubenstein, Editor-in-Chief of SD Times, and before we get into the program, just a couple of uh, brief housekeeping announcements. Uh, first, um, today's session is going to be recorded uh, and will be available a few hours after uh, the event is finished uh, on the sdtimes.com website where you can listen to it over and over again to your heart's content, share it with friends and anything else. Uh, all right, secondly, uh, today's session will be followed by a live Q&A. Uh, to ask a question, simply go to the uh, question area of your control panel, type in the question, hit submit, and we'll get to as many as time allows. Okay, so today's webinar is going to um, look at the collaboration between IBM and Mapbox uh, to build a chatbot-driven progressive web app, and the one that they built helped South by Southwest attendees find the most interesting sessions, films, and music gigs. Uh, there'll be a, a demo uh, which uses IBM Cloudant, Watson Conversation, and Mapbox APIs and SDKs. Uh, this uh, helps them build an app that uh, reflects the user's interest, uh, and then it creates personalized recommendations based on time and place, and then it presents those results on a map. So with us today uh, to do the presentation is um, uh, two speakers. One of them is Raj Singh, uh, who's a developer advocate and open data lead at IBM Cloud Data Services. Uh, he specializes in all things G geospatial and hacks on analytics in R-DB and Spark slash IPython notebooks, uh, among many other things. Uh, he has a PhD from MIT, and he worked on geospatial data interoperability challenges for the Open Geospatial Consortium before joining uh, IBM. Uh, with us also today from Mapbox is Ryan Bauman. Uh, his job is to integrate engineering, sales, and support skills to help build and implement Mapbox apps. Ryan splits his time between writing code, onboarding new users, and ensuring that Mapbox's enterprise customers love their Mapbox tools and launch successfully. So I'm gonna hand it over now to Raj to get us started in the program. Raj, take it away. Hi everybody, thanks for joining us this afternoon or morning. Um, so we're gonna talk about apps people wanna use that's the basic point, you know, and we do that through chatbot-driven interfaces, adding some cognitive flavor to uh, progressive web apps. Now, the first thing I want to do is introduce who we are as an organization. I am in the Watson data platform, and let me just position that for a second within the IBM Cloud offering. So IBM has a cloud, like a lot of other companies, and we are hoping, or we, we know that businesses are moving more and more functionality to the cloud. Our part of this whole uh, experience is to deliver data-driven data -driven, uh, user interfaces and applications. So the Watson Data Platform specializes in data engineering, data science, business analysis, and application development. If you move an app onto the IBM Cloud, you'll be deploying it in Bluemix, which is a terrific uh, application deployment environment, whether you write it in Node.js, Java, Go, Ruby, PHP, uh, all those are available to you. And then what you want to do, what you want to do with your application, obviously, is pretty much always connect it to a data source. And that's where we come in. So we, we manage a series of hosted databases from Cloudant, NoSQL JSON database, DashDB, uh, columnar data store, specializing in analytics, uh, Spark, you know, big data analytics, and everything in between, Mongo, MySQL, all the things you'd expect to be available. Now, what we do beyond that sort of core competency in deploying database-driven applications is we have a unique ability to add some interesting data sources very easily, like Weather through our acquisition of the Weather Company last year, Twitter through our partnership with that organization, 
And then through the Watson technology that's developed over the years, we have a really strong competency in machine learning and a series of Watson APIs that came out of that, such as natural language recognition, speech to text, um, conversation driven interfaces, which we will get into in a second, and geospatial capabilities, of which we are not, you know, completely terrifically strong on, and that's why we partnered with Mapbox, who is terrific at some of these mapping and geospatial um, angles. So this is a lot to sort of a lot to digest, especially if you're new to the IBM cloud and sort of the, the idea of a lot of a data platform in general with all these capable or cognitive capabilities is probably new to many of you as well. So I'm going to try to illustrate a lot of these concepts by bringing it all together in an application. We developed South by South for South by Southwest this year. And we're calling it the uh, cognitive event finder. So when we were asked to um, bring something to the to the festival this year, IBM had a big installation with lots of different forward looking technologies being on display. And from our perspective, from the Watson data platform, we didn't want to just talk about, you know, what databases do and what what you can do by adding data to them. We kind of what everybody wants is to make all that transparent to the real goal, which is, as I said in the beginning, making making apps people want to use. And the biggest way we can make apps that people want to use is by being very contextual and just you know, making making interaction with your application more like interacting with a person. So when you're talking to a person, first of all, natural language is is key. You'd much rather, you know, talk in a in a very natural way rather than type out commands or fill out a form, which obviously is going into some database. I think only developers are really. I I find this with my wife often, which is. If there's some web form, if I'm doing my taxes or something else, filling out some form on the web, I'm really good at doing that because I know how the developer built it. If I'm if I'm a non-developer and I don't that, have that kind of mindset, uh, I think things are a lot harder. So, moving towards natural language generation, I think, is the future of of a lot of ways in which the general population interacts with um, data-heavy backends. You also want to meet users where they are. We made a very conscious decision not to build a native application or a very fancy web page. We designed this thing so first and foremost, you could just text with it. Everybody has, everybody's familiar with texting. Everybody has a texting application on their phone. Um, so that's where you want to be. If somebody's moving around on a conference, they don't want to install something new or do something like that. They're probably texting friends, figuring out where to be, what's interesting. Why doesn't why doesn't our application work in the same way? People are in their phones in text messaging. And uh, don't make them work if you don't have to. So use everything you know about them to deliver relevant information. If somebody is interacting with you from their phone, you know where they are, where that device is. You know what time it is. And from knowing where somebody is and what time it is, you know lots of interesting things. Um, you know the weather, you know what they might be. You know they're probably out South by Southwest since 30 people descend on a five block uh, radius around Austin, Texas. And so there's really a lot of contextual information you can bring to bear without the person having to tell you anything additional. So this is um, primarily a technical talk, so I'll give you a quick overview of how this all works. So as I said, we support, we built a web app, but it can also be interfaced through text messaging. And you'll see here this little square box of a Twilio icon, Firefox, Chrome for web apps, Safari. So you can either, this person icon up here can either talk to our system through the web browser mobile web browser or text messaging through a Twilio interface. And whatever they say goes back to a Node.js application, which figures out if this is a part of the conversation dialogue, it'll send that whatever the user 
uh, said to Watson conversation to figure out what the next step in the conversation is going to be and send back the response. That dialogue with the user continues back and forth until the Node.js application knows, hey, this is not a message which needs to be sent to Watson conversation. We've finally gotten down to the point where we have information we need to search the database for. And that conversation determined whether the user is interested in looking for music gigs, uh, film screenings, or interactive sessions. And so with all that information, we take it, we do a search on Cloud and Cloud and is a NoSQL database which supports a few different types of search. Uh, geographic, Lucene free text search, which you may have heard of. Solar, I think, is the most popular open source implementation of the Lucene engine. And there's also Cloud and Query and MapReduce as other search options. We use the Lucene search option for this application because it com combines geospatial query temporal query and free text search all in one all in one uh, request and then when we get back the results all the resorts uh, have know their location they have a geospatial component so we can take that information and use the mapbox apis for mapping to create uh, instead of returning a actually we do return a list of results but we also show all those results on a map so it's a very natural way to figure out what you're going to do next. You're walking around a conference, you uh, do a query, you want to know what you want to see next, and that, and uh, going to that place will involve getting there, you know, in a map-based user interface. So I'm going to quickly show this. Here's the app view. So the first thing the app does is ask for your name, so it can be more personal with you and ask you if you want to search interactive music or film. I said interactive, did a search, and it switched over to a map view with my results. The orange dot is where I was at the time, and you can see how far away certain events are. And so that's it. It's very quick. Once again, you don't, people are not interested in your application. They're interested in getting to something interesting. It uh, should, should be a very light touch and not something that you know, they have to spend a lot of time with, otherwise they won't. So here's how we built it all. As I mentioned, there are three steps we're gonna go through. The Watson conversation development piece, the cloud and search piece, and then the mapping part. So let me introduce you to the Watson conversation, which is a, it's an API, which combines a number of cognitive techniques to basically build a chat bot. You can very easily you know, without any knowledge in a couple hours, build your own chat bot to do customer service or uh, conference, you know, session search or anything else uh, very quickly. So the key ideas behind developing a conversation are to create intense entities, dialogues, and take into account context. Intents are the possible meanings of what the user says. So in a natural conversation, there's a lot of different subtle ways to say the same thing. What we need to do in a conversation is take all those possible nuances and drive them to a single intent so that we can know uh, what's the next step to take in the dialogue. Entities we actually don't use in this application. But they're parameters in the user's text that could be of uh, real critical import. So, you know, let's say places, for example. If, if you're driving people to, if you if you have a chatbot which is trying to drive people towards finding uh, the nearest store location, you'll want to be really concerned about entities because your, your entity might be a zip code or a, or an address or a town, and so you'll take that entity. That's the important thing you need to do to map the person from where they are to your nearest store location. <clears throat> dialogues are the way we hook it all together in a conversation. You take the intents, what they said, you figure out, you know, out of the all the different possible ways you could say something. You could say yes, uh, many different ways. You could say yep, yeah, yep. Yes, all those different things. Take those, drive it to a single intent, in that case, yes. 
And then you have to say, okay, what's my response to that? Yes. And that's where the dialogue comes in. Dialogues do the request response mapping. And then often you need context is about keeping track of what the user has said in the past to, uh, to further the conversation. So often you're not just doing a, you know, the response to one request is often dependent on a, a few prior requests. So you need to take into account context throughout throughout your uh, conversation. And here's a link to a good um, blog post which talks a little bit more about how, you know, all the, con all the details of the conversation work. So with that background, I'm going to show you a little bit about the one of the intents we built for South by Southwest. So as I mentioned, there are three main things you can do. You can search for music gigs, film screenings, and interactive sessions. So here's our intent to, around driving people to search for interactive sessions. Our intent is called, all intents start with, start with, a, with a hash symbol. So our intent is hash event by topic. And here are some different ways that we can get to that intent. If somebody says category or find tech sessions, or I know the category, or I know the topic, or interactive, search interactive events, all these things mean that we want to search event by topic. And Watson Conversation is smart enough not to just key on these terms that we define, but take those terms and <clears throat> do a little fuzzy logic on them so that if somebody has spelling error or somebody doesn't use the exact same words or some combination of those things, you'll still get to the event by topic intent. I'll show you a little bit about the dialogue. One thing you should notice here is that the conversation design is um, expressed in a really nice user interface where you see, <clears throat> where you can see the flow of the conversation as you build it. So we have, three main entry points for a dialogue. If you're a completely new user, the first step of the conversation is ask username. Um, if you're a returning user, our conversation starts with returning user. And if somebody just doesn't want to give it, we have a skip user to name um, starting point as well. But either way you go, you're eventually going to be driven into this returning user flow where you have a whole series of choices of things you can do. Um, steps in the dialogue where you can go next. We chose to push a lot of things up to the very top of our dialogue because we didn't want people to have a, a very big drill down to make a request. Um, in some other systems, if you're designing a customer support application, you may want to have a highly structured drill down mechanism where you're getting you know, you have to know certain things about um, what somebody's trying to do before you ask them further questions. In our case, we, every, you know, at the very top, we know you want to find something about South by, uh, find events by topic or by speaker or by, or ask our system to suggest something or do search for music events or by music artist name or film events or some of the ones you can't see or by uh, actor and director things like that. So right, at, for right up front, you can ask for any of those things. So if you ask for event by topic, you see here a little bit of code. So we're, here's where we get down to the nitty gritty of actually uh, getting to the search place. So hashtag event by topic says the Watson response will be okay, tell me what topic you're interested in. And then when somebody responds to that, we're done with the conversation. We have the search term we want to search the cloud and database um, for, for interactive sessions. And you'll see here in the bottom right corner, context actions get topic. So going to the next slide, you'll see that action get topic triggers a uh, search. You'll see here in the next thing, and the user enters the topic, and we go to context action is search underscore topic. And what that says is if action equals, then in our code, in our Node.js application, which this gets passed to, we uh, break out of the conversation. This is the key code which breaks us out of the Watson conversation piece and takes us into the cloud and search piece. 
So you'll see if action equals search underscore topic return handle search interactive topic message. And this is where we go into the Cloudant search. So there's some code in there, which actually Cloudant. Cloudant is, um, is a database which doesn't operate by database drivers. All the requests are done through uh, HTTP GET requests so, or a POST. So it's a purely RESTful interface. And if you look at the code later, which all the code is, av code is available uh, on GitHub, you can, you can find that piece of it. And now let me talk a little bit about Cloudant. So a NoSQL database is a little bit different from a relational database in that you can have, you're storing JSON documents of any type, any schema. So all the documents could have different fields in them basically. If you wanna think relational, you can think of every record having different, different columns or fields. So that makes for an impossible, impossible uh, search search problem really you cannot index or you cannot optimize a search where you don't know what the fields are so what no sql databases do or schema list databases do is you have a step where you index and it, an index is a document which basically says which fields are going to be available for search and <clears throat> so it makes sure that the right fields are available um, if this if the document has these certain fields available, we're going to index it and optimize it for search. And so for so in our case, we we have a few different indexes for different searches. This this uh, index that you're looking at now is for the interactive search. And you'll see the first thing we do is say if not doc dot music and not doc doc film. So we're getting rid of all the documents which relate to music gigs and film screenings then index these fields. Um, we'll index the date field, doc.time underscore start. We'll index the name, the description, the track, and the tags. If I was to show you the indexing documents for, for example, the film, um, the film search, you would see, you'd also see start and name and description, but you'd also see actors, directors, and producers. So <clears throat> you can think of a NoSQL database search, or you can think of a NoSQL database as being just a collection of documents thrown on the ground, and it only really becomes a database when you create an index document for it. And so you can have, and one database actually can look like multiple databases to a search. Another interesting thing about Lucene search, which we do here, is you can boost certain terms. So you'll see here boost fields here. Uh, name has a boost of two, description has a boost of one, track is two, and then tags have a boost of 10. They're the most important. So if I search for augmented reality, if it just appears in the description, that is a less important search result than if it appears in the tag. So you'll see how <clears throat> in a very simple single search, you can make certain mm, certain results rise to the top. Um, sorry about that. So I think we've covered everything else here. Yep. And we in every document we uh, we index the date field so we can search by time. So here is just for this is hard to read or if you're not familiar with cloud and cloud and search, this will be you know, not very useful to you, but I'm just showing the request here. A cloud in search hits a design document here. So all searches start with underscore design. You also point to the index. The name of the index document was by underscore topic. So we eventually point there. Like I said, the index document tells you what it makes the database look like a smaller database of just things that match, uh, match your indexing terms. And then what we do is whatever words the user types in, we, we create this query. So if the user, for example, in this query, if the user typed in development, we're searching the name field for development or track development or description development or tag development and date. And we put in a date range. We assume that the person wants to see something next. So our date range is a timestamp 
of whatever time it is at that current moment, three hours forward. So you're only getting stuff that you could do now. And you'll see here that um, on the left below the query, I'm showing you just a sample document here. Actually, the whole thing is one document. Um, I had to split it up to get on the slide, split it up into two pieces. So the, here's the style of the document you'd get back. You can see your name field, your time start, time end field for the session. Uh, description is actually a paragraph or two. I'm just showing the first line of it. And it's a panel. The type is session. Uh, we have some speakers in there that you could also search for. We have a place. And you'll notice that in addition to the name of the place and the address, we're also storing the, this uh, geometry property. And this is a standardized format called GeoJSON. The geometry type is point and the coordinates you see there, the uh, X and Y GPS coordinates. And below that, you'll see tags and hashtags. So as I said before, development as a tag would prioritize this result much higher than finding development in the description or the name field. So our query returns a whole bunch of these documents that, that match the query. Um, then we want to show them on a map. And so we get back when all this JSON data comes back to the client side, we are using a Mapbox JavaScript client library to do all the mapping. And it takes, ignores most of the other stuff. Well, it doesn't ignore the other stuff about the document, but it takes this geometry property and it uses it to put a pin on the map. And then it uses all the other data as a pop-up. So when you click on that event on the map, you'll get back a description here. And so I'm going to switch over to Mapbox now to talk more about what they do. And, in addition, you know, not only what they offered to this project, but what they do more in general. And so just to summarize, we do a lot of great stuff on the Watson data platform, polyglot data storage, and any type of database for whatever your problem is from NoSQL to analytics to relational. Watson APIs make that more cognitive and, and better. Uh, you can put it all in Bluemix Blue an application deployment. Um, location, so you have a one-stop shop for everything you want, deployed in pure hybrid cloud. And then we add in Mapbox for a lot of the stuff we don't do as well, uh, geoservices, mapping apps, and client-side computation. And I'm going to let Ryan tell you more about that. Thanks, Raj. Uh, so this is Ryan Bauman. I'm at Mapbox. I run the sales engineering team there. And one of the big things that I worked on with Raj uh, and the rest of his team at IBM uh, for the South by Southwest demo was taking everything that they had built in, as part of their cognitive application on top of IBM services and make it interactive, make it something that the user could visually understand what they want to do and how do they get to the place that they want to go uh, to an event at South by Southwest. Uh, so I'll take a step back here real quick and just talk about, hey, how do we do that as Mapbox? Uh, so Mapbox itself is, is, is the developer tools and toolkits that you'll use to put location into any of your applications. So that's everything from the map data itself to all of the data about the road network and uh, the addresses and POIs that you might need to reference. And then it's all the tools around working with that information at any scale. So that's your rendering that you might need to do in your mobile or web application. It's all of the, uh, the interactivity with that information inside of your application and integration of that within your application. And then like changing the context and the style to tell the exact story, the exact user experience that you want, that's the tools that we built. And, then, and that's what we help you uh, as a developer make a very easy experience experience. So that being said, what do you have available for you and what parts did we use to build this South by Southwest demo? Uh, so here are some of the building blocks that we have in the South by Southwest demo here. We use the Maps API, which allowed us to pull in a custom base map style that had 
custom icons that matched the IBM brand for South by Southwest. And that also allowed us to really control how the map uh, looked and felt to like contrast the data that we were overlaying on top of it. So part of it was, hey, I'm gonna serve up maps to my application uh, and I'm gonna customize how they look. The way we customize how they look was actually from uh, some of our rendering tools, uh, which is our GLJS and GL native tools for mobile. And that's just all about how you turn data into a really great looking user experience. Uh, and then in addition, we use that, uh, some of the analysis techniques here. So we use some client side analysis techniques to just figure out, hey, what's the bounding box of the data that was sent back to me? And potentially what's the distance you know, from where I'm located to where these events are located. Uh, and you can get a little bit more complicated than that too, but you can do, because of the way Mapbox tools work, you can pick up all uh, these analysis tools and actually either apply them on the back end uh, in Cloudend or on the front end, depending on what type of question you're asking or what kind of user experience that you want. Um, so yeah, those, those are the main things that we're using here uh, for this particular application. We also have all the tools around integrating navigation and directions into your application so that you don't don't have to kick your user out to a native application on their platform right inside your app on mobile you could have instructions on how to get from where you're at to where uh, the user wants to go uh, so that you kind of continually get to control control and own the user experience along the way uh, so yeah we have lots of different tools along those lines that you might need along with directions like geocoding hey I'm at this location what you know POIs are nearby me uh, and curated data, uh, like what place am I in right now? Uh, what context around me would be useful for the user to know how would that look? All those sorts of things is, you know, the, the building blocks of Mapbox tools. So what does Mapbox look like when you throw it into your application? It looks like basically changing your traditional chlorpip map of population density, like the map in the top left-hand corner shows. Uh, it's 2D, it's got a nice, you know, uh, a categorical legend associated with it going from green to red, which is nice. Uh, but well, I can take that exact same data uh, and make this population density visual on the right, which is way more interactive and allows me to answer a lot of different questions. One, it's way more detailed, right? I'm able to go down to census block level information. Uh, two, it's not pre-rendered. So the user can actually change the extrusion height, for example, like it's showing here in the GIF. Uh, of what the population density census block height should be. Uh, and also the color scale is changing there at the same time. And I, I don't have to make any network requests to do that. So I'm, I really decoupled, you know, like my visualization from having to know what the user wants to ask ahead of time and allow them to be able to say, hey, it, it allow you as the developer, I should say, to have control over how you want to expose that information and how you want the user uh, to change how they interact with it based on what they select. Uh, just like in our South by Southwest demo here, where we were able to change what was displayed and how it was rendered to the user based on what they had typed into the Watson chatbot, uh, and then uh, you know communicate with them via the Twilio APIs uh, for text messaging. And uh, along Along that same lines of controlling the user experience, uh, what we were able to do in the South by Southwest demo was do things you can't do with traditional maps without a lot of uh, manual work that's just really easier with Mapbox developer API tools. So as you can see here in this example, you're taking a, uh, this is a, a data set from New York City's open data uh, that allows you to, uh, you know, take a lot of data points about restaurant complaints in this particular case. And we're actually binning them into hexagons, just like, you know, binning them into spatial boundaries would be no, no database or server required in this cloud could store all the information, be a perfect integration with this sort of application, very similar to what we did with South by Southwest here. But I'm actually able to calculate what the style should be uh, on the client. Hey, I have, you know, more points in this particular hexagon than this one. It should be a darker color of red. Uh, when I click on one thing, I should be able to control how the user drills down into that information. Um, so all those things are really at the developer's uh, fingertips with, with Mapbox APIs and, and rendering tools. And that's, you know, that's kind of what we, we took advantage of here for this, for this application. So diving, diving into that, uh, how, did, how did it work exactly? So in this case here, we were able to uh, use Mapbox's 
on the fly rendering technology using WebGL uh, to take data directly from what Raj just showed uh, uh, that IBM's Bluemix APIs returned from the query that we created that had that GeoJSON format information with location and a whole bunch of different metadata properties. We're able to pass that directly to Mapbox's uh, WebGL uh, rendering tools, which what, what, what it did in the background was is the browser actually cut this really powerful uh, form of spatial data representation called vector tiles. Uh, and it cut that all on the browser on the fly without any you know, backend services that had to be implemented uh, on, on the IBM cloud side. So we're able to offload all of that job to A, the browser, so that scales really nicely, and B, is really plug and play on top of something like Cloudant, where if you return a JSON document, Mapbox can literally just in, in one line of code, hey, here's the URL with the query parameter, for example, that I wanted to pass. Uh, here's how I add it to my map. I put that one line of code in and I can visualize that information and where it's located and now I can control how it's styled in the exact same way that you saw, you know, population density controlled by uh, color and by extrusion height or NYC uh, noise complaints controlled by the number of complaints within a spatial bin. We did the same thing here uh, with the South by Southwest app. Uh, yeah, so this is the this is exactly that one line of code. There's map dot add source. I put you can call it whatever you want. We call it the my data. The type is a geojson file, and the data is located at this particular URL. Uh, and from here, it's it's really just okay. Now the data has been cut into these powerful ve vector tiles. Uh, all of from a developer standpoint, all I need to do now is communicate how do I want the user to experience this information. Uh, and you can write that without even writing JavaScript. It's really just uh, writing some JSON configuration documents. Uh, and in this case, we ended up matching the icons of what the pop-ups were to match the uh, IBM design guide for South by Southwest that their design team had come up with. And those was little white, you know, quotation bubble pop-ups that match the rest of the design around uh, the, uh, the, the event in, in the IBM booth. Um, so because of that, we were able to abstract the data from how it looked and how it was rendered all without having to write any complicated or custom you know kind of designer oriented code we have we're a bunch of engineers you know putting this together in a, in a week or a week or so um, so yeah I mean it, it can look great without a whole lot of work which is amazing for, for engineers especially thanks I just jumped back to the screenshot of the of the application itself so you can see the uh, IBM IBM's a big company and you often get requirements come down from you from above um, and so we quickly you know in half an hour we were able to say oh okay so you want everything to match the this is, this is the iconic iconography you're putting together for the um, event so we can use that Watson conversation slash document icon in our application as you see here the little the little uh, sort of a talk talk box with the document on it we can make that our push pin for the map instead of sort of a generic push pin that you often see in other places and, and to top it all off building on what Raj just said uh, we actually got to the demo booth the, the day of or the day before and saw oh wow with you know the big screen setup that it's gonna be on and with how it's gonna look in this booth we really want to change how the map looks a little bit to match that and because we use Mapbox, it was, you know, I changed one thing in the background based on some pictures that, uh, that Mark and Raj took uh, who were on site at South by Southwest. And we were able to update that on everyone who used the application instantly. And you'll see that unlike, uh, you know, some map that you'd see on, on a navigation application or on Google Maps, this doesn't look like your normal street map. And we didn't make it black and gray because we wanted everything to look like it was the middle of the night. It was because that was the thematic color scheme of the IBM activation space at the conference. So we were able to, you know, very quickly in a matter of, in a matter of minutes really, be able to take some of their, you know, take their color palette that they gave us and make everything in our application match, match what they wanted. Okay, jumping back forward. So I'm going to finish up our uh, our presentation with a little bit about the back end, a little less sexy here. But 
when you're building an application as an organization, you need to know how well that application is working. You need to do backend statistics. You want to know, is this working for users? What could we do better? Where are they falling off? Um, what are they, how are they using the application? What are they clicking on? All those kinds of things. Uh, you want to do some analytics on that. And often, you know, in an organization of any size, the same people aren't doing that who are building the application. So we have another piece of this whole thing where we take the, well, first of all, the application was designed so that every message that was recorded between in the conversation with the user and every result they got was saved to a separate database, uh, our logging database of everything that was done. We were able to take that logging database, which was also in cloud, and, and bring it into another offering, cloud-based offering from IBM called Data Science Experience, which is an online self-service way to do analytics, Spark-based analytics. You can write your analytics in any language you want, uh, Python or Scala. And so we were able to easily bring cloud and data from our logging database into the analytics environment and transform that data from the non-relational, um, once again, which is often a pain. A lot of the big data analytics products re really operate on a relational mindset. So you need to do a little bit of data massaging to get it into, to go from cloud and into relational um, mode. So that you can so that you can run big jobs on it. We wrote a little Python to shape that data for that reason, and then we used a a plugin to notebooks that was built in house called Pixie Dust, but that's open source as well. If you're a Jupyter notebook user, and if you know what that means, then you know who you are. That you can uh, install Pixie Dust yourself, and it's a zero code way to build build bar charts and pie charts and line charts and and tables and Mapbox maps right inside your uh, analytics notebook. So we're able to get back all the records of um, all the user searches and all their journeys through the dialogue, through the Watson conversation, and do some analytics on what, on where users dropped off, where we lost them, what they eventually searched for, they use it in the daytime or the evening, that kind of thing. And we made nice pie charts out of it like you see here. So the biggest search term was AI, second biggest was VR, and there were some other ones that brought up the rear in the top 10. And this was highly you know, influenced by the fact that these are people who came to the IBM building in, in the first place and also who came to our booth. So they were, you know, pre, they, they, they were self-selected for people who were interested in cutting edge technology topics. If, uh, if we were over next to the Comcast building or something like that, you'd get very different results. <laughs> Probably a lot more, you know, movie star searches and music searches. But for for our audience, people were very interested in design and tech and VR, AI, augmented reality type stuff. And we have this is also a, there's a Medium article on on this uh, topic, which you can use to get to all the, the data sets. We actually anonymize the data set, so you can just grab the whole data set and play with it yourself, or at least you can learn how to do it. So we put together a real story around um, using the IBM Cloud as a, as a development shop to not only build a data-driven chatbot interface, build a great application that you can do, deliver as a mobile web app or through a text interface, but also you can take that data and in a single place bring it into an analytics backend and study how uh, your application was used. And the big lesson, at least from my, my point of view, being a developer on this project was looking back, it's hard to believe that we were able to build this and three weeks, not in our spare time, but with all the other things in your job going on, built this demo in three weeks, three developers, and we we're all in three different time zones. And we rarely stepped on each other's toes. We rarely uh, made a mistake that messed up somebody else's work. And 
that was because the tools were so <laughs> I, I know I'm kind of uh, biased here, but the tools were so good. API driven development allowed us to have a separation of concerns, which, which was very powerful. So when I was working on building up the database, uh, Ryan could progress with his mapping work separate from um, uh, my colleague Mark, who was working on the chatbot, the conversational interface. We could all sort of work uh, on our own pace. And GeoJSON using the standard data format was really important from the point of view of integrating well with Mapbox because there was um, no custom development required. We both cloud and had native support for indexing GeoJSON as a spatial format. Mapbox has built in support for mapping GeoJSON on the client side. So that was, uh, you know, almost uh, something that we didn't even notice, but was a huge win as compared to if you didn't have that base to start with. And finally, the schemaless database point is a point about how great cloud it was. And it's hard to really describe how powerful this is without doing it, without doing some work with cloud because when you're building up a database, you often, you always change the schema. You're working with, you know, when I was putting in the interactive sessions, there was a bunch of things I wasn't interested in capturing. Um, there were some things I were, and, and from feedback from the group, uh, added things over time. And just being able to have that flexibility without redefining a schema, re recreating the database, you know, recreating key, primary keys and all that stuff, that you deal with in the relational world was a real, real uh, asset to fast agile development of the whole system. And so I've just, this slide is really not for you to read and write down right now, but when you get it later, you can check out some of these links and get to all the things that were talked about here. And, um, and thank you for hanging in there and listening to this presentation. I think we're ready for questions. Yes, okay, excellent presentation. Uh, one of the things, um, we have some questions already from attendees, um, so we'll um, kind of uh, get into this. If, if somebody's just starting out with this type of development, what is the fastest way to get started with the uh, IBM and Mac box to create these types of applications? Well, the, <clears throat> the best place to get started is probably through one of our blog articles. So we have a, a new presence on medium.com call and uh, you'll find it in the links here, but our, our sort of home on medium is IBM-Watson-Data-Lab. We also have a, a GitHub repo, a GitHub account, which has a lot of the code that we have developed in the course of building demos and working with our, our systems. So there are two, I guess it's a two prong strategy. Number one is go to bluemix.net and play around there. Bluemix.net is the application deployment platform where you can not only you know run stuff, you can get access to the databases. You can, that's where you buy anything you wanna buy that we've shown today. Sometimes you can get lost in there because it's a big place and that's why I said the other the other prong of your approach is to go check out our uh, blog articles so you can get quick how-tos and get started easily without just diving into the whole sea of, of technologies and, and APIs. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, uh, Raj, so uh, let me ask you, uh, if you could just repeat the APIs that you mentioned that are being used in this app and then explain what other Watson services that could possibly be integrated uh, into the app to add uh, more uh, cognitive capability. Sure, the main things we used were Watson Conversation and Cloud and Database and the Mapbox Mapping API. And then we built our custom Node.js application. So our custom Node.js application ran, ran on Bluemix. The Watson Conversation API runs on Bluemix. Mix and the cloud and database runs on Bluemix. Um, <clears throat> Mapbox, you know, well, the main thing we use for Mapbox is the client side library, so that 
you know, was part of the runs on the client. Uh, and also some of the, the other uh, in the background for maps. There's the sorry, yeah, in the background there's the maps API that you're using for Mapbox as well, which hosts and distributes all of the data for the mapping part of your application. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's a good point. Because right. <laughs> you spend a lot of money on having having all that map data, base map data, data available for the whole world, and having it <laughs> and it's having it return guys just along those. Yeah. And having that return to uh, the client in milliseconds is a big deal. And then some of the other APIs that you could use that we didn't use from the Watson suite are natural language, understanding, um, topic mapping. If you have a big corpus of documents, you want to index, it can pull out important topics out of all those often used for you know, medical research or news index art, uh, indexing and things like that. You've got speech to text and text to speech APIs. You have a really cool API around image recognition. You can analyze an image and pull out the main objects in it and that kind of thing. And the database suite is extensive. Any kind of database you would want, CloudInt, Mongo, MySQL, Postgres, um, <coughs> DashDB, as I mentioned, any data, and. and any uh, database you need for <laughs> for whatever you're doing is available there. Excellent. Okay, uh, I have a question for Ryan, and uh, so that is, uh, so how is Mapbox different from like Google Maps or Bing Maps? Oh, yeah, great question. So Mapbox is number one, completely open, and we're all of the building blocks behind how you put spatial and location into your application. Whereas if you get a package from uh, some of the existing players out there, like your Esri's, your Google's, your Bing's, A, uh, you're only gonna get the experience that they want, which will be optimized around, you know, usually a customer or consumer experience of navigation. Uh, whereas with Mapbox, you can pick up the exact pieces that you want from the rendering tools to the backend analysis tools to the hosting and serving tools to the tiling tools. Every part of our stack is totally open where the building blocks behind it, or you can pull up up each of the individual APIs and use them and, and integrate them into your application. Uh, and then number two, the biggest thing is owning the entire experience of how you put a, uh, location into your application. So that's everything from being able to control your data, whether it's from Mapbox or from your own infrastructure, uh, with the exact same capability and functions as you have in native maps. So that's things like making 3D extrusions with your data, like I showed in, uh, in the presentation today. Uh, that is the type of capability. Each time we add to our mapping stack, you get the exact same tools as the developer. And that's really the difference there. Whereas with other providers, they're going to give some capability to their core stack, but they're not building it for everyone to use. We, we are. Excellent. Okay, we have another question from one of our attendees who would like to know, uh, as a user, if I communicated with the chat bot via messaging, how would I see the maps? Does it send me a map as a photo, a URL? How does that work? Good question. You're paying attention. Like, yeah, we, <laughs> there's no way to show a map in a text message. So you, what you get back is a link, and that fires up the web application. Um, I'm just going to show you. So we didn't talk a lot about progressive web applications. I forgot to do that piece, but you'll see looking at the screen here that here's the application in a web browser. And you'll see if I go into development mode and I will, you know, toggle to be showing, uh, showing it as it would look on a mobile. So you'll see the application automatically degrades or upgrades as you go to a mobile view. And if you're looking at it in a web application, you'll see the whole map at once and the, and your chat window. Uh, if you go to the mobile view, you're just going to see the chat window at first. And you have to click a button to show the map. So, and I can't really show you, you know, live the text interface because you'd have to have to have a camera on my phone. But the text interface is much like much like what you'll see here in the web app. So I'm going to just do this search for interactive events. 
and I'm going to search. I don't know now that the event is over. I don't know what's going to what's going to appear here. But you'll see that's a that that just happened live. So we just got a map back in you know seconds, and it switched from the chat window, which was over here, back to the map window. So if you were in text message, you'd just get this listing here of of results, bring web technology to feature animation, blah, blah, blah. In addition, you'd get a link at the bottom saying, here's a link to see it on a map. <clears throat> and that's an important aspect of the Watson Conversation API, the context I talked about, is that I you send with it the, the context of whether you're in the web app, whether you're in the uh, web app looking like a web app or the web app looking like a, like a mobile phone-based application, or whether the request came through text message. So you know exactly what to send back to the user based on what platform they're on. And I'll build Excellent. on top of what uh, Raj said there too, that if you wanted to send an image as a text message, uh, Mapbox has a static map API that you can overlay dynamic GeoJSON objects like points with you know custom icons like this is right here. So you could potentially send back a static image in your application if you if you wanted to. Yeah. Very interesting. All right, looks like we're uh, right uh, close to the top of the hour, so I'll ask uh, both uh, Raj and Ryan to give us um, some final thoughts in about 30 seconds or so, and uh, I guess we'll start uh, with Raj. Yeah, well, thanks. Um, we're definitely, uh, I think I'd just end with a comment that I'm in the developer advocacy group, and our whole job is to help developers be successful on our platform. So definitely get in touch. No question is a bad question. And let me know how I can help you get started with any database or application development or even analytics um, aspects of using the IBM Cloud. Very good. And Ryan? Hey, thanks everyone. Mapbox is all about making location in your app as a developer really easy. Uh, so if you want to get started, go to mapbox.com. We'll lead you right through whatever your platform is, web or mobile, on you know, here's the code you can try out, here's the example you can make, here's the tutorials you can follow if you can get started really fast. In the future, we're working on, or right now we're working on a lot of really interesting areas uh, in the automotive cell self-driving space with you know maps are behind a lot of what's enabling self-driving games and virtual reality applications uh, so this is really just the starting point so if you have bigger spatial dreams in your application uh, definitely check us out that's fantastic yeah we certainly can see that this is uh, as you said the future of a lot of things where you need location uh, uh, capabilities and uh, to things to know where they are so that's uh, very cool. Uh, I'd like to thank both Raj Singh from IBM and Ryan Bauman from Mapbox today for uh, joining us for this great presentation. Of course, I'd like to thank IBM uh, who sponsored uh, today's event. And uh, on behalf of uh, SD Times, I'd like to thank all of you for uh, joining us this afternoon. And until next time, I'll just say so long.